All right, so we're going to talk about um, kingdom and country. And um, my hope is to stay as close as we can to Scripture and try not to have everybody be offended. Um, Because, you know, they say that the best way to start an argument is to talk about religion or politics. And I'm going to talk about religion and politics. (laughs) What could be better? Um, So let me pray for us, and then um, we're going to jump right into it, and I will not talk as long as Rob did. (laughs) That guy. I'm just kidding. It's all up to you. All right, so let me pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that you will give us wisdom as we look into your word. And we see um, the way that you have ordained government and the way that we need to be a part of it while also realizing that we have a citizenship in in a nation far greater than America um, in your kingdom. And I pray that you will help us to understand where these two line up and what our responsibilities need to be and where our identity needs to be found. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so um, you guys all know the uh, Lee Greenwood song. That's all I had to say, right? I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. It's good, right? If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd worked for all my life. Um, Now, I love that song. I I think it's wonderful. I, I mean, God bless the USA. Yeah. I love patriotic songs. God shed his grace on thee. Yeah, I love that. Um, but my, uh, my first reaction is when I think about um, I'm proud to be an American, the song, do you know where I heard that song growing up the most? In church. Yeah. And what Rob was talking about earlier was the special music. I can remember, you know, whenever there was a patriotic holiday, and we would have church, we would, we would sing patriotic songs, and, and I grew up in a church where we did have an American flag and a Christian flag, and we would, I mean, we were very serious, um, especially around Memorial Day and Veterans Day, and I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm very thankful. My father served in the military, my grandfather served in the military, my great-grandfather served in the military, I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful, and I really am. I can, I, I'm proud to be an American. Now, my problem is, is that so much of that influence was in church. Now, you might be thinking, well, of course, I mean, that's right. I mean, if it's good, then why wouldn't it be in church? Well, good question. We want to talk about that. So I want, to, I want to ask, I want, I want us to think about that, and then we, I also want us to think about where we're finding our identity. Because for so many of us, there's a natural tendency to identify first and foremost as an American with a, uh, with a Cloyd Rivers zeal. And I think, is that right, and is that healthy? And so... We, I, and, and of course, um, there's some things we're not going to have answers for. There's some things I don't have answers for. And there's some questions that even studying to prepare for this is brought up that I'm, I'm still working through. But what I want to do is I want to look and see what does Scripture say? What does Scripture say about our relationship to the country that we're a part of, the government that we're, that we're involved in, and the kingdom of God? And if... If, 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 there's, if I say nothing else, if you hear nothing else from what I say, let's make sure that as believers that we are finding our identity as citizens in the kingdom of God instead of as an Americans. Now, the, the, the easiest way to think through that is because there is a chance in all of our lives that you will not die as an American. What? Time out. There's a chance I'm not going to die in America? What do you mean? Well, first off, you can move. And secondly, 
America could lose. Now, for some of you, that is mind-blowing. And you, you may have gotten, you may get aggravated or frustrated. America could go into a global conflict and lose. We could be taken over by another regime, empire, country, whatever. And if that happens, your faith should not be shaken. Isn't that crazy to think about? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about what if America gets taken over? I, I don't. I don't think about that. Because America. <laughs> that was my answer. That's why. America. Mur, M-U-R-I-C-A, Merca. Right? You can't beat us. And most likely that's true. They really can't. But what if they did? Do you guys know that America is not an eternal kingdom? We need, to re- we need to think through that. We need to realize America is not an eternal kingdom. It's not even an old country. One of the deacons at our church um, just went to Europe, super cool, and he was talking about going uh, at this, uh, like a vineyard in Italy and that the main house had been standing for over 500 years and I think oh that's America times two and that's a house right America's a breath there's a good chance if the Lord doesn't come back which we don't have to get into that right now that's a whole different breakout session um, America could come and go several times over before the Lord comes back And so if our identity, if our security, if our faith, if our hope and our trust is in America, then it's misplaced. So let's think, so those are are some cautions, words of caution. So let's look at what the scripture says. I'm going to look at two two main passages of scripture. I'm going to look at Romans 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, We need to be the ones who, you know, as uh, there's a, passage in Psalm 20, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's, we need to focus on that, right? That's where our, our faith, our hope, our trust is in. All right, so let's look at Romans 13. Romans 13, uh, starting in chapter 1. Let every person be subject. Okay, let's time out again. Sorry. You guys know who wrote this? The Apostle Paul, right? Um, the Apostle Paul was Jewish and a Roman citizen. All right, and so he's writing this to the church at Rome, and uh, at this time, there's a guy's name is Nero. He's uh, he's an emperor at um, for, of the Roman emperor uh, of the Roman Empire. There we go. You guys ever heard of Nero? Good benevolent king? No, right? Not yeah. He, you guys do remember? We talk about man. It's like man, they just like throwing me to the lions. <laughs> right? Yeah, and Nero did that to Christians literally, right? Okay, let's keep that in our minds because I think that it's easy for us right now to be so um, culturally blinded where we say, oh man, Jesus has to be coming back soon. It's gotten so bad. It's the worst it's ever been. Have you guys ever feel that way? Man, it's just the worst it's ever been. This is so bad. I mean, this morning, I was in my climate-controlled box that I live in with my family, and I got off of this soft mattress, and I had to get up and push a button so I could have coffee. See how terrible it is? This is the worst, this is the worst it's ever been. And, or we'll say, man, look how, look, how, look how much sin is rampant. Or, I mean, let's, let's go straight to it. Look how evil politicians are. I mean, there are some evil politicians. But let's think about Nero. Nero, you guys remember what he would do. He would dip Christians in wax and then tie them to a big pole 
and then light them on fire so he could have Christians as his candles. All right. Paul's writing under the Roman Empire, and he says this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you receive approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, where are we at? I lost my page. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay attention to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. What a weird perspective. Because you guys remember, you guys know how Paul died? He was, Nero um, sentenced him to death and he had his head cut off. Okay? Isn't that interesting? Now, what he's, when he's, what he's saying here is, in general, this is the role of government, that God has established government rule. Like, he has established the government. And the reason why he's done this is to provide a place for good works to take place, to provide um, evil to be punished and good to be rewarded, right? So we see specifically, that, and this what's really interesting, is that he's saying that God has ordained and established the government in general, but also individuals, the individuals who are ruling, right? Because then what's the other option? Yeah, that's exactly right, right? So we have government that has been established as an institution to... To, get, to, uh, to combat anarchy and chaos, right? So this is a good thing. Government's a good thing. In general, even when it's run by sinful human beings, right? It's fascinating. And what we're seeing here, he's saying even when it's run by an emperor, a, a dictator. And I mean, you guys remember Roman emperors? They often, it was often a practice for Roman, Roman emperors to have worship given to them by the people. Isn't that fascinating? But what we're seeing is, in general, God has instituted government, but also even specifically. And I think this is really helpful for us to think through, especially if we want to hold to a high view of the sovereignty of God. Because either God has instituted these individuals to be in these positions, or God couldn't stop it because it was out of, it was out of his control. Now, I don't know which kind of God you want to serve or who you see reflected in Scripture, but I see a God in Scripture who's in control, who's ta who takes charge of things, that nothing happens without him saying, yeah, this can happen. I'm working this out for my good, right? For, for, you, for our good, actually, and his glory, right? So we have God has instituted the government in general, and then we see individuals in particular. We also see, um, we also see that he's saying that if you break the law, you're disobeying God. Now, I have to do a caveat here, because we're talking in general, right? This is, this is, these, are, these are general principles that Christians need to live by if we're going to be obedient to the Lord. And he's saying that you need to be obedient. You, if you break the law, you're disobeying God, unless you're disobeying God. See what I did there? Because we do see some biblical examples of, of appropriate civil disobedience. Can you think of any? Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, yep. <laughs> Would you say Jesus? Absolutely. And then uh, the disciples, and the disciples specifically, Peter, when in, in Acts 5, when, uh, you know, they were put in jail and he came back out, and he said, should we obey God or man? So there is, there, there, in, I, I think scripturally, 
There is a place for civil disobedience, but that is when it's going to, you're going to have to choose. Because typically, for most of us, like when you pay taxes, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to get political. Too late. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Um, now, I think there should be, there is some taxes that are immoral, but we don't have to go into that. Um, but it says that you should pay taxes, right? And especially for us in America. Now, why would I say especially for us in America? Well, because we have, in our culture today, every one of you has more opportunity to be a citizen of another country. So if you want to, if you're saying, I'm not going to obey these laws, that's totally fine. Move. You have that right. Nobody is forcing you to be an American. I think about it, um, and Jonathan Barry and I went to school together. Hello, Jonathan. Um, and they had, uh, we went to a seminary, a Southern Baptist seminary, the Southern Baptist Seminary. Sorry, guys. It's the legal name. It's articular. The Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. You mean, you mean Dr. R. Albert Moeller, Jr.? I'm just kidding. Um, I don't really care about Southern that much. I thought it was a great, it was a good experience for me. We actually send a lot of people to Southeastern now. Um, but if, if it's any other one of those, I actually would say mean things about you, so let's not talk about it. Um, but they had rules there. And we had, some of the guys in our house, we had some debates over some of the rules that they had. These are stupid rules. And I said, that's fine. Don't go to school here. You're a grown-up. You know? And But what we're seeing here is we're seeing that for the most part, when you are obeying man... When we're talking about the government, you're obeying God. When you have to choose, is it better for us to obey God or man? Well, obviously, that's when you obey God. That's the caveat for civil disobedience. But what, what Paul is saying here in Romans, he's, he's stating the general principle. You should obey. You should give revenue. You should, and that, what's interesting is he also says, he says uh, taxes, revenue, and then honor. I think that's really big. That's very important because for us, we also need to understand that we do need to give honor where honor is due. And that's why I think, man, especially recognizing those who have gone ahead of us, who have sacrificed their lives for our freedoms, we honor them, right? Now, that's great, but are we also realizing that there are today brothers and sisters that we have throughout the world who are dying for the sake of the gospel. And if we can say someone deserves honor so that we can have some sort of freedom in America, how much more honor does someone deserve who's been killed for the sake of Christ? Again, man, we got to make sure we don't get backwards on this. All right? So let's move on. Um, so we see the next passage of scripture I want to look at is uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, oh, yeah, never mind. Um, I, I want to say this, that we do, what, another thing he says here that I didn't really mention is that government is intended to punish evil and to provide an atmosphere for good works, although imperfectly, right? It, we, it, it doesn't matter how good a ruler or government is, they're not going to execute these things perfectly. And we understand that we're fallen human beings. All right, First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 is so fascinating to me. Again, you know who wrote this. This is Peter. He's writing about the same time. Peter also is executed um, under Nero's orders. Only he's crucified upside down. All right? Let's just keep that in mind. So we're in the same context. He says this. Now, I'm, I'm starting a little further back. I'm, I'm going to go from 9 through verse 17, but I'm going to walk through his argument the way that he walks through it. So starting in verse 9, he says this. Um, but you are a chosen race. He's talking about those who are in Christ, right? Look at what he's saying. Now remember, Peter was Jewish, right? Peter was a good Jew, and then he became a Christian following Jesus, which is what good Jews were supposed to do because Jesus was the fulfillment of Judaism, right? Okay, so keep that in mind. And remember, he's writing in a context where even for Peter, as, as he was growing up, his identity was in the nation of Israel, 
They were God's chosen people. That's why we call them God's chosen people, right? And it was very much a nationalistic pride and honor because they were Jewish, right? So much so that they dressed differently, they had their hair differently, they ate different food. It wasn't like the guy who's wearing um, all red, white, and blue with, with tattoos of bald eagles, right? More so than that. That's what the Jewish nation did because in, because God intentionally set them apart in everything, right? Okay, keep that in mind. And he says, and he's writing to a mixed group of Gentile and Jewish believers who've been scattered all over the nations. He even uses terminology, the dispersion, um, to intentionally include non-Jewish people who are the original dispersion. You guys realize, You guys remember that? Um, Vic even uh, referenced it this morning when God sent, um, uh, when he took uh, the Israel and Assyria, conquered them and displaced them. Babylon conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, displaced them, and then they all kind of came back. Well, part of them coming back, they just stayed in different places until they were dispersed. So there was a Greek word called the diaspora. That's right, the dispersion. So there was a dispersion of Jews, and then Peter's intentionally taking that term and applying it to a mixed bag of people, Jews and Gentiles. That's huge. Do you see how, what a big deal that is? And it's good. if you don't, you're going to see it's going to come clear. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you see what Peter's doing here? Peter is doing something enormous in the, in the advancement of Christianity, right, in our historical journey. Because what he's doing is he's taking labels that were intentionally to set apart the Jewish people from every other nation, and he's applying them to Christians, I mean, these are even genetic, right? So you a chosen race from the line of Abraham, a royal priesthood from the line of Levi. Like these are like sacred titles that the Old Testament used for national Israel. And now national Israel has been displaced with the kingdom of God. Okay, so as we're thinking through this, if the national identity of Israel, which was established by God and was the way that salvation came to every other person for thousands of years, if that has been displaced for the kingdom of God, how much more so the nation of America? Do you guys see what I'm saying? I mean, he's making some huge points here. He's, he's tying things back to, to, to us as believers, because we would say that this, you know, obviously, 1 Peter is written to New Testament Christians. We're New Testament Christians. This is to us, right? There's some specific things that we're not going to understand contextually, but we need to, right? Because look, so he's talking about us being a people for his own possession. So if you're in Christ, this is you. Look at some of these, this language he just used. I'm going I'm to grab it from its original context from the Old Testament. Ezekiel 19, uh, sorry, Exodus 19.5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Peter's saying, do you remember this a treasured people, treasured possession that the Jews were? Now, in Christ, that's all of us. That's huge. Deuteronomy 7, 6, again, the Deuteronomy is like, Deuteronomy is the most enjoyable book to read to me, just so you know. Uh, uh, yeah, when Rob was talking, read through the Bible, Deuteronomy, wonderful. He says this, this is uh, Moses, is just sermon of, of sermons to the people of Israel. For you are a people holy to the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And what Peter is doing as he's saying, this isn't just for Jews now. This is for those of us who are in Christ. Again, Isaiah 43, 21, the people whom I formed for myself, that my, they might declare my praise. Malachi 3, 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, and the day when I make, up, I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son and serves him. And then he also says, once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you know where he's cherry-picking that from? Do you guys remember? In Hosea, 
Remember, Hosea had two kids with Gomer. He had uh, Loami and Lo Ruhama, which means Loami, not my people, Lo Ruhama, they, no mercy. And then in chapter two, he talks about how he's restoring the people of Israel. Those who are not my people will be my people. Those who do not receive mercy will be, I will receive mercy. And now Peter is taking that and saying that was always about us. This is huge. Man, I, the, so for us, our identity should be in this. Where's your, where's your identity? Is it America? No. I'm a chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's huge, Right? Let's move on, continuing his argument, because he, he goes through this so we can find our identity in this. And then he says in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. We're going to see that a couple times. Sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of your flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So he is calling us as God's people Sojourners and exiles. You know what that means? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Isn't that fascinating? Because we can say that. Man, we, we hear that and we're like, yeah, man, I'm an exile, sojourner here. I'm just a pilgrim wandering through. This, I'm not made for this world. I'm made for another world. And then we get so obsessed with pity little things in this world. Isn't that crazy? And it's so funny. I mean, we really do. And we think, okay, I don't know where you guys are from, all of you. I grew up in a really kind of like super conservative, uh, independent, fundamental Baptist church where we took the fun out of fundamental, (laughs) kept the mental. And... uh, and I can remember when the book, 88 Reasons That Christ Will Turn in 1988, came out. And uh, it wasn't true, just so you know. <laughs> Jesus didn't come back in 1988. And I, because it was so easy, and I'm going to, I might step on some toes, and, leave, and I'll give you a hug afterwards, and I'll apologize. But w- it was real in the circles that I grew up in, we would look at the book of Revelation and we would find cities, Gog and Magog, and we would attach to them, well, this is obviously Moscow. Obviously. So we're the only people would, that would have known that in the history of Christianity. And you're thinking, but now it doesn't look like it's Moscow anymore. Okay, it's something else. Probably. It's probably something specific that you don't know. Cool. And I can remember, I mean, we were saying, man, it's so bad. And then we would, Gorbachev was the Antichrist. And if you follow along, you just need to find the next big bad guy, Saddam Hussein, Antichrist. It's happening right now. I can remember some people. Obama is the Antichrist. Are you serious? What are we doing? And we'll get so obsessed with trying to figure out what political leader ruler right now is this depicting. And then we miss, we miss the entire point of the book of Revelation. And we wind up getting so obsessed with something that is so temporary... And we bypass something that's completely and totally eternal. Because we're just so caught up in this. We're sojourners. We're exiles. We need to be focusing on eternal things. Oh, man, eternal things. I don't even know what that could be. Look to your left and right. C.S. Lewis has a wonderful quote in, uh, in The Weight of Glory when he talks about how we would be so overwhelmed if we could see what everybody's eternal state would be. It would be either something we'd want to worship or a horror such as we only see in nightmares. And then he said, kingdoms, nations, rulers, they are but a breath, but human individuals, human beings are eternal. 
He said, you've never come in contact with a mere mortal, right? If we're going to be focused on eternal things, then we need to be focused on getting more people into the kingdom of God and not letting all of this temporary stuff take our mind off of it. So, I mean, on a practical level, I'm just going to be completely honest. If you're spending several hours a day watching uh, talk or listening to talk radio, watching news shows, reading political blogs, you are spending so much time on something that doesn't deserve it. It, it doesn't deserve that much sustained attention. I'm sorry. It just doesn't. Because, you know, it's going to be like, you guys remember Frederick A.C. Muhlenberg? What? <laughs> Freddie Muhlenberg? You don't remember him? How could you not remember the first Speaker of the House? How could... It's only been like 230 years since he got elected. 230 years. That's a breath. Eternally. And you know what? We're going to be... Obs- your, your grandkids are going to be talking to you, and they'll be like, Man, you spent how much time reading about who? What are they doing now? Oh, he was a senator. He was a congressman. Okay. Is that really how you want to spend all of your time? No, of course not. You might, but you shouldn't. Okay. So, so then he, Peter moves on, talks about how we're supposed to live in this temporary world, right, in light of our eternal inheritance, and then he says this, right? This is, this is practical. This is where we're getting right now. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to, whether to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Sounds so similar to Romans 13, right? For this is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. How interesting, He says, live as people who are free. Okay, what? He just said, be subject, be submissive to every human institution. Live as people who are free. Do you guys see this contradiction? Be submissive, be free. What's he saying? He's saying you need to be subject to the human institution. Why? Because God has placed those in authority over you. And that if you want to truly be free, don't use your freedom as a cover for evil, but live as servants of God. And there are most of the time in our lives, especially where we live right now, it's, they're going to align with each other. Obeying God, obeying man, being, being subject to human institution and living as servants of God will be the same thing. And that's where I, I want us to understand, like... I, yeah, I've taken some time bashing people who are obsessed with America as if it's the most important thing in the world, and, I, and rightfully so. We need a reality check. But then we do need to realize we have, we have the ability to live in a nation that was unprecedented in world history up until now. Could you imagine? I mean, Paul and Peter are telling you to be subject to the authorities, the governing authorities, right? Well, they both get executed by these governing authorities. But... We live in, in, in a society, a, a, an experiment in self-government where we have the ability to take part in the people who are governing us. Whoa. Until we get taken over by the Ruskies. <laughs> hey, if they can do Red Dawn twice... How do you sleep at night? <laughs> but what's so fascinating is, again, he says he's general and specific. He's subject to rulers and authorities, and then he mentions the emperor and the governors, right? So our obligation to God is to be faithful to the ruling authorities placed over us because God's the one who put them there, all right? Then he says we are free, which is crazy, because they didn't live in a free country. (laughs) That's what's crazy. Uh, He says we're free, but we use our freedom to be servants of God. All right. Next thing I want to look at is how our, our citizenship is in heaven. 
This is where I want us to, man, we, we have to draw our identity from this. There's three passages of scripture. I said I wasn't going to go as long as Robin. I'm not going to, but I am going to have to speed up. Three passages of scripture. We'll go through them uh, barely, but I want you to write them down. Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Hebrews 13. I mean, sorry, Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. I'm going to read through these. I'm going to draw a couple things out so that we can, uh, uh, we're, we're reinforcing the same thing. It's not like the Bible is saying a bunch of different things that are contradictory, right? We're just reinforcing them from different angles. And Philippians 3, 17 says, Brothers, join, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have. For many of whom I've often told you, and I'll tell you with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with their mind set on earthly things. But you guys know what's coming. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Do you see what he's saying? Our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven and we're waiting for our savior who is also the Lord. Do you see that? We're not wasting words here. He's our Savior, but he's also the Lord Jesus Christ who is subjecting all things to himself. He's the real king. Our citizenship is in heaven where we're waiting for the appearing of our real king. That's huge, right? So if we're having our minds constantly set and focused on earthly things, then we are misplacing our thoughts, we are misplacing our meditation and our attention. Ephesians 2, oh, let me make sure this right. Yeah. The, yeah, let's, not make, let's make sure that we're not becoming too easily distracted in earthly things because we are, not, we are only temporary sojourners and exiles here, but we are eternal, permanent citizens in the kingdom of heaven. Ephesians 2.11. Okay, I don't have time Ephesians 2.11 is awesome. Uh, 11, through, 11 through 22, where he's talking about how God has taken the Jews and the Gentiles again and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility that existed between Jews and Gentiles and has brought them together to be one. All right, again, this is such a big deal. Paul is writing this. Paul is a Jew. Jews know that uh, there's a distinction between Jews and Gentiles for a reason. And he's saying God tore that down, right? Making uh, the, uh, in, uh, okay, um, I'll, I'll read starting in verse 14. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down the, in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law and the commands expressed and the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility and he came and preached peace to those who were far off. Those are Gentiles, that would have been us. And peace to those who are near, that's the Jews. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Man, that's awesome. And what, and this is what, if, when, if we're going to argue from the lesser to the greater, right, that we're seeing that for the Jews, right, their citizenship was everything to them, and it was supposed to be, and that's been torn down for a real citizenship in the kingdom of God. So how much more for us as Americans? You guys need to know something. You guys know America is not God's chosen nation. That'll get you kicked out of a lot of churches. Don't say that. We're not. America's not God's chosen nation. We got to, we got to understand that. America could very well crumble and fall. And depending on whatever your views are of the end times, we might still have a couple more thousand years. And if we do, America will most definitely crumble and fall. And you'll, and people will know as much about um, the, uh, the American experiment as they do of the Ottoman Empire or Prussia. Did you guys know there used to be a Prussia? It's not just another name for Russia. Very confusing. 
And that, I mean, let's just keep that in mind. So if, if, we're, if, if Paul is telling Jews, who he was a Jew, that their, their identity in the nation of Israel was, was put away so that we could include Gentiles in the kingdom of heaven, our citizenship is in heaven, in the household of God. Yeah, it says being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. What unites you together? Stars and bars, baby. Well, that's not as important as the blood of Jesus. And we need to make sure, because no one's going to say that. No one says that out loud. But we say it all the time in our actions. Shame on us. If we think that stars and bars can unite us better than the blood of Jesus, where's our allegiance? Where's our identity? All right? Um, yeah, so then uh, Hebrews 11, we'll look in Hebrews 11 real quick. I'm two thirds of the way through my notes, guys, no worries. Um, I can fly through some of this. Hebrews 11, I love, you know, Hebrews 11 is awesome, right? The hall of faith where you've got, man, look at, how, look at how God used all these people. Look at how God used all these people. In the middle of it, he has this. He said, these, man, this is awesome. He says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Huh? If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Did you know that that's not talking about America? Am I, again, am I thankful for the sacrifice of men and women who have given us the freedom to worship God? Absolutely. This is not my homeland. If this were my homeland, it would be worthless because it's going to come and go. But he's talking about these people who had faith who put their faith, their trust in God. They didn't see where they came from as their homeland, but they were searching for a homeland, a, and they were longing for a city, a heavenly one, with Christ in it. And later on, it, makes the, uh, it, make, it's, it calls these people, says, those, those, those of whom the world was not worthy. That's exciting. May that be said of us, Right? The world is not worthy because this isn't our home. Again, some will say, yeah, and we talked about this a little bit, yeah, but it's far worse now. We, what these guys were talking about, they had good, it was a, a good empire. No, of course not. Rome was one-third uh, slaves, right? The Roman, Roman empires wanted to be worshipped. They killed Christians. I mean, that, and made a sport of it, Right? And then some will say, but, you know, isn't America? America is a Christian nation. And America, that's a difficult question because yes and no, right? Not now. If someone says America is a Christian nation now, they're just misinformed. Sure, if you look at the Pew Research, you've got 70% of people claim to be Americans, but only 20-something percent of those claim to be Protestant evangelicals. They're throwing in everything that's, anything that could possibly be, have a church, they throw it in there. So we're not, I mean, percentage-wise, we're not a Christian nation. And you can't call us a Christian nation if we've legally killed 61 million babies in their mother's wombs since 1973 legally that we know of. Oh, that's not a Christian nation. Now, I don't want to, again, I'm not, I love America, but we don't have to baptize everything in, in America to make it Christian. You guys realize that? It's okay. We've got really terrible spots. I mean, if you're a Christian and you go to the Middle East, do you have to justify the Crusades? No. You can say, man, that was wrong. What? Christianity did wrong? Yeah, Christianity did wrong. 
They were bad people doing bad things, claiming to be Christians. Has America done wrong? Absolutely. America's done lots of wrong. America does wrong today. Does that, and wait, how, you said you're proud to be American? I am. You know, I think about the beauty of America is that America was, and this again, I say, the, the reason why I'm saying that America is a Christian nation is because America was founded on Christian principles. Now, did, don't mishear me. I did not say that the founding fathers were all Christians because they just weren't. Historically, they were not. But they, in, in general, they had a Christian understanding of the world and developed Madison and Adams, which I don't know if they were believers. It's, I think it's really up in the air. But they constructed a government system that kept, that kept in mind the whole way through the depravity of man. You guys realize that? It's so funny because for a lot of us, we're like, man, the government's so slow moving. I hate it. They can't get anything accomplished. You know, that's on purpose. Do you guys know that? The government intentionally, we separated powers, had limited government, have checks and balances. Everything is intended to move slowly so that one person and a, a one executive doesn't get enough power to be, to be an emperor, to be a king again. We've intentionally slowed things down. Why? Because we don't want one person to have too much power. Why? Because power corrupts. There was a guy, oh, it was an English lord, Lord Acton, that said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We see that. We're not naive. But that is a Christian principle. The, the untrustworthiness of individuals with power, that's a Christian principle. It's called sin. And... What about in the Declaration of Independence, right? I, I don't know where my notes are. I've, I've gone off the reservation. Yes, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Well, they, they took that from the Bible. That's Genesis 1, that we've all been created in the image of God. And so, yeah, way to go, America. But have we, has America always enforced this? No. In fact, concurrent with its writing, we were destroying it. Because how many of the founding fathers owned other human beings that had been created equal? Well, sure, they said, well, they're not human beings. Well, that's wrong, right? We've got to be careful. We don't have to baptize our history to make America a Christian nation. We can say America was founded on Christian principles that we're thankful for and that America needs Jesus. Now that's, we don't have to say any more than that. Um, so a couple warnings. I'm going way too long. I'm sorry. I said I wasn't going to go as long as Rob. Don't trust me. Yeah, you should. You should. Man, back to you. Okay, anyway, it doesn't matter. All right. Okay. And, and yeah, anyway, so, so the warnings, Jesus is an American, just so you know. He's not. He doesn't have a bald eagle tattoo. Uh, America is not the kingdom of God. We got to remember that. And we need to make sure that we're not misapplying scripture about something else to America. Man. Be careful. I'm going to read a passage of scripture that people have read about America, and it is not about America. And I hope I don't offend you. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, you guys have heard it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven, and I will hear their land. Uh, it's, I've, it's, that's paraphrased. Is that about America? No. And it's crazy because I remember the church I grew up in. Again, man, we had a campaign, the Heal Our Land campaign, because he will forgive our sin and heal their land. Do you guys know what this was actually talking about? Rain. This is about rain. Solomon, the dedication of the temple says, if we sin, God, and you shut off the heavens so that our crops won't grow, then we'll repent. And then you can heal our land by sending rain. Now, did I say 
man, then we can't. Second Chronicles 7.14, that's not for us today. Of course it's for us today. It's just not about America. It's setting a principle that if we sin, then we need to come to the Lord in confession. He will forgive us and he will give us healing. But we need not, there's no, we don't need to say, oh, this is about America, right? Then we're just teaching people a terrible way to study and teach the Bible. You can't do that, right? So be careful. Um, a couple other practical concerns, um, and that is this. Um, we need to realize, especially in our churches, in our congregations, that not every member of our congregation is American. And I would add, nor should they be. And so think about that. In fact, there are people in every one of our congregations whose family history has probably had America as the bad guy. And if not, then you need to reach out to some more African American or Native American people. But think about that. When we're saying America, 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 and you've got somebody whose family is Native American, you've got somebody, you've got a black family who has had, who had, who the, the nation said that first that they weren't individuals or citizens, and then that they were three fifths of one. Right? It's in the same way we need to show sympathy. Uh, especially on Mother's Day, for, for women who couldn't have children. Imagine that, how that woman feels. That's the same way that these people feel if we're just celebrating America. America's hurt people bad. And you need to know that there are people in your congregations that have been hurt by America and have a just indignation against the way America's acted. Okay? Next. Um, we should show honor where honor is due. And so that's why I said, man, definitely, should we, should we honor fallen heroes? Absolutely. But we also need to include more people into what we call fallen heroes. They're not just servicemen and women, but are their brothers throughout the world who are being killed today for the name of Christ. And the last thing, just some, in conclusion, as, I, as I've gone over all my time, um, in 1 Timothy 2, he says, first of all, I, then I urge you that supplications, prayers, and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful life, quiet and godly and dignified in every way. Right? We, need, we need to be praying for those in authority. We need to be praying that they have wisdom, and especially, not, I mean, crazy, that he, we're seeing this happen in the Roman Empire, but even more so now, because now there are more people involved in government that we're a part of that can actually affect change for the good. And then... You yourselves, we need to be able to take, we need to be taking part, doing our part in our, in, in, our, um, in our, our, our civic duties. Our citizenship in heaven should lead us to be better citizens on earth in the kingdom that we're a part of. We actually saw that, that we, we have writings from the first and second century Rome, uh, a Roman historian who talked about how uh, the governing authorities saw Christians as peaceful and quiet people who are living rightly. And then um, the last thing is we need to exercise stewardship, right? What we're experiencing in our world today is unprin- un- unprecedented, unprecedented world history. We need to have, uh, provide a good stewardship for that. We need, we need to be accountable for how well we handle that. And then we need to keep longing for a better city. And we need to look forward to the final eternal kingdom where King Jesus will sit on his throne. So we need to be active in our heavenly citizenship now committed to bringing as many with us into that kingdom as we can, right? That's good. Let me pray for us, and, uh, and then we'll take uh, at least a five-minute break. Gracious Lord, we love you. We do pray that you will be exalted in all things. I pray that you'll help us to really think rightly. Forgive us for how we make idols of temporary things and that we ignore your eternal kingdom. And I pray that we'll be on mission for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, thanks, y'all.